Hi guys, Brexit has impacted many people in many different ways, but while we tend to focus on those who are importers and exporters, farmers and those in hospitality, we tend to forget individuals. I had the privilege to speak to a man called Edgar who finds himself in a particular Brexit situation. He's caught between a European rock and a British hard place. I hope you find this interesting. Hello, Max. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I currently I'm sort of uh, <laughs> just having a gap year from kind of university studies. But um, before that, I used to work in casinos, actually, for at least a decade. And most of the time I was actually working in other countries. So, for example, I worked for three years in Latvia. I worked in Malta. Uh, for a couple of years, even in Switzerland. Uh, so that was really fun. And just living in other countries, you know, I had a skill, uh, a, a certificate, a kind of in Britain, you would call a licensed dealer. So you had this license that you needed, which you, wasn't the case in other countries. But that meant that... Um, British dealers had some kind of, casino dealers had some kind of uh, extra sort of security element to them. And I just really enjoyed being able to live and work in other countries. Uh, but at the time, I never, I was into politics when I was younger, but I was never really thinking about e the EU or the benefits of being in the EU, simply because, um, you know, I was just born into that, system right i was born in the early 80s so i and then never really uh knew about it i remember actually when i was i think living in latvia that was when these farage videos kept getting posted of, about his rants in the uh in the european in, parliament in the european parliament and, and actually that's like the first time i had ever even seen sort of <laughs> the european parliament you could say i was i was quite ignorant in a way of uh, of it but um but i, I think that's i think that's the yeah. case for many people they they you know they were born into into britain when they were when it was part of the european union things were sort of normal it was normal to you know uh, jump on a train and and go to paris or jump on a plane and go to italy or poland or germany or wherever so it was quite normal you know whether it be for a holiday or be, be it for for study for example with erasmus or something like that um i, I just be, before we get into like what's happened to you um post brexit um do you remember the brexit vote coming in do you remember you know checking about it online what happened or were you following it at all <laughs> so um i was living in malta at the time when sort of this the build up to brexit was happening and um i actually no no so i was working with other british people well, international staff completely international staff uh, in a uh for an online gaming company in malta uh, malta is very famous for the for having online gaming companies and live dealer studios and all of this but there was you know plenty of british people nobody was talking about brexit or anything like this and i barely didn't even really know it was going on right and then i actually left my job there because i'd been in the same job for five years it was the same company that i worked with in latvia so um you know i'd been in doing the same thing for about five years i was a bit bored of it and I actually, maybe I made a big mistake. So I came back home and suddenly, I think right after I came back, there was this whole Brexit thing going on. And I remember my father saying that, that oh, this is completely ridiculous. And he actually said, one of the first things he ever said was, but what about Northern Ireland or something, right? <laughs> so uh, and now, you know, that's people are going on about it, but um, not many people were talking about that either, right? So and i was a bit shocked you know um i hadn't even made up a really a proper opinion yet because i hadn't really heard the pros and the cons but obviously there wasn't um having lived in europe for most of the previous decade i i wasn't really um <laughs> i wouldn't say it was uh kind of pro brexit but but i was willing to sort of give it 
like I want willing to sort of hear the, sort of what, what the benefits of it were and so on. I wasn't, you know, like on one side or the other, let's put it that way, uh, even though it's obvious that I should, should be on the, the EU side, but it wasn't like that. And once it happened, I remember I was in London with a group uh, of people uh, that I was with in London and uh, people were absolutely devastated. I was there the next morning after the vote. So I'd only been back a few weeks and people were absolutely devastated. I could see their faces. Uh, obviously, in this group that I was with, people were mostly, I would, you know, it seems like they were mostly pro-EU, but people in London, you know, I mean, a lot of these people were, you know, maybe EU citizens uh, from EU countries or whatever, right? But a lot of them were British. And actually, suddenly, I remember their faces and they were so devastated the next morning. It's like a shock. Like, well, what's actually happened? And that that suddenly then to me, I suddenly thought, oh, yeah, hold on a minute. You know, what's going to happen to me? Because I kind of like just getting jobs in Europe, right? And I, I actually went through some pretty um, kind of uh, tough time because I, I was trying to think, what am I going to do? And I didn't really want to work anymore in the... The casino thing i was trying to kind of get out of it and so i decided to actually i thought maybe i can do some foreign language teach english as a foreign language efl teaching uh as a sort of new way to maybe get in go to another country so in the end uh not immediately but in the end i did a course you know a celta course at sheffield university and then i went uh and i kind of took the first job that i saw <laughs> which was in poland and I'm still here in Poland uh, after all that time. So I've, I've just sort of went there and stayed. But actually what happened was I, after one year of teaching in a school, like a language school, I actually decided I'm going to do some full-time studies uh, because, again, something I didn't know about when I was younger, in Poland, there's no student fees. It's free. For EU, so EU yeah. university tuition is free in, in Poland. For EU students, or EU citizens, and yes. of course I was an EU citizen, you've got to remember, I'm not now, but I was when I uh, applied, when I was still in Poland. This was in 2017, 2018. Uh, and so I could get it, you know, for free without the tuition fee. And... Of course, you still got to pay for, you know, your living costs and all that. But even in Poland, actually, they have um, for people with on very low income families or people with disabilities, you can apply for money um, from the university. Also, you can get scholarship money. So, for example, after the first year, I had these very good grades because I was just dedicating all my time to studying and I could get the rector scholarship so I could get money from the university for like because I'm a good student and I kept getting this money every year. Um, you know, it's not a huge amount of money, but it, for students, it, 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 helps. it helps. Every little helps. And also students in Poland, well, people like under 26, they get a lot of discounts, you know, cinema ticket, you get this all go over this discount on the trams, public transport, you get half price tickets. Um, um also you know or just if you have a student card um and uh also the um I, i've lost my train of thought but basically there's oh yeah also if you're under 26 i think you don't pay tax uh from in, like income tax so when you start thinking about it compared to britain which is all i kind of knew even though i worked in other eu countries um, you start thinking, well, well, they get a lot, a much better deal, right? Can you imagine, you know, if I went to university, people say, well, why, why did you come to Poland and study and, and so on? Can you imagine if I studied in England, I'd pay nine and a half thousand pounds a year student fee just for the privilege of being a student. Then I've got to pay accommodation costs. And I don't know if you've seen documentaries about uh, yeah, what the quality conditions sort of, students yeah, are living in or the BBC yeah, yeah the, you know ridiculously terrible conditions and and they're paying ridiculous amounts 
and basically it's like um yeah well that opportunity i would say people come over here and study but <laughs> now it's a bit more difficult <laughs> But, but, um, but, but also you have another problem, because if you want to return to Britain to, to study, there, there's also another problem for you. What's that? Yeah, I mean, you know, because sometimes I thought, well, you know, maybe I'd like to do, for example, a PGCE, which is a, a teacher's certificate where it, it could be one or two years, I think, in Britain, you, you from a British university and you do some teaching and you get this uh, teacher certificate. Um, but I mean, that's not really possible because if I did that, I'd be giving up my uh, residency uh, in Poland, which is, you know, not, uh, you know, if you're out of the country for more than six months, well, then you kind of, that's like you void your temporary or permanent residency status. So, you know, I, I basically, I'm a little bit stuck here now. It, the same thing again with, you know, I could have maybe you could go to another country in the EU and study, but I don't have the right to go to Germany now or Holland or something like that. And I could study for a few months or something, but I don't have the right to just move there and do a course for more than, say, half a year. So, I think this is, yeah, I think this is so important because people like the, it was taken for granted that you could just go to whatever country you wanted. You could stay there for as long as you wanted. You could study for as long as you wanted, and then you could move around. But because of because of the ending of freedom of movement, means that you, if you go to Poland, you have to sort of stay in Poland. You can't move around. If you go to Germany, you have to stay there. And we've seen it with, like generally in the media, they talk about businesses who are struggling to import export. You know, to do trade shows, for example, if they want to do a trade show, it's a massive amount of money they have to spend. And they have a, a huge amount of paperwork, but you know the the media don't really cover personal stories like like yourself, where you know if you if you go to Poland, you have to in a sense stay there. You can't really move around, and it's probably a big shock. Like I don't know, have you met other British people in Poland who've had a, similar experiences? Have you talked to them about that? I mean, there are a lot of British people. <laughs> Here in Poland, for what for various reasons, very rarely, uh, I would say for studying. I mean, I think I'm, I'm pretty unique. Uh, in, in you know, um, well, I mean, I have a friend who we win the same class, uh, for a couple of um classes in Wrocław, but he 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 was half Polish, half British. It, it doesn't count. But um, the I don't really know, like, I don't go into people's sort of personal stories or whatever, but I know there's a lot of British people who have moved here with a Polish wife, maybe, or a Polish girlfriend, but I think it's usually if they're married, which gives them a quite an advantage if they are actually married to the Polish um, woman, because, um, you know, it's much easier then to get sort of... Uh, kind of permanent residency and things like that yeah the the, um, the the citizen can in a sense be like a guarantor for for um the the british expat or migrant or whatever way you want to call it yeah so i think there's that advantage but, um, but i remember but, i remember when i um when i had to apply for the uh we were everybody in everybody was already in poland at the time of brexit actually actually leaving you know the eu um, all had to, even though you had your sort of residency a piece of blue paper and so on for the EU, you had to reapply for all of this all over again. Um, and which, by the way, in Poland is really not <laughs> what you want to do at all. No, like in Italy, I imagine. <laughs> um, you know, they don't speak. You know, they're not, you'd be lucky if they speak uh, any English in these uh, offices and so on. Um, they're not really going to help you, uh, but um, uh, and basically, I, there's some I heard. I, I don't know the source, but I heard it from the actual kind of official immigration people that Poland had the most applicants for this article, beneficiary of Article Fifty uh, residency permits, Carta Pobitu, it's called here thing, and. That, I thought, wow, that's that's amazing. You know, why Poland? You know, but when you think about it, you know, uh, there's quite a few possibilities. But one, I think, is just because 
a lot of Polish people came to Britain and then had a relationship with somebody in Britain and then had this choice, well, we stay in Britain or we stay in Poland. And a lot of people just moved to Poland because they had a, a Polish uh, partner. Um, but also, I think, like if, I, and we mentioned before, this was uh, how maybe the economy in, in Poland is, is improving. Um, yeah. I think it was Donald Tusk said recently that... Um, the average pole will will be earning more money than or will have a better quality of life than the average Brit in a number of years time or or maybe even at the moment. So, you know, the, the quality of life is better, maybe um, wages are higher or or whatever. But also the, the fact that if you're in Poland, then you're still in you're in the EU and uh, you have better. I mean, you're right. Matt, you're right in the middle of the EU, really. I yeah. mean, <laughs> you know, uh it's sort of the kind of the gateway to the east and the west of, of, of Europe, really. Um, it's a fascinating country. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's, I mean, I've been to Germany quite a few times recently and you, you just go, you can go in a car and just go over a bridge and, uh, you know, not, not have any check or whatever, you know, to yeah, see. The, the, yeah. It's an open border in a sense. Can, can I ask you, um, have you, what has been the reaction to Brexit by Polish people you've you've encountered? Have they asked you about Brexit? Have they asked you about why the UK left the European Union? It's normally, I, I've, I've, a lot of Italian people I meet ask me, what was going through the minds of British people? Why did they vote to leave the European Union? And we can get into a very long conversation about that. I, I don't know, have you had similar experiences? I mean, I think I think now people don't really ask. I think sort of probably people, at the beginning it was. Yeah, I think now like people, people sort time. of like just moves on now because I don't really, uh, you know, people ask me why did you come to Poland and so on and stuff like that. But yeah, at first um, I think uh, I just think that I mean you'll get some people of course who think oh yeah that that's you know, get on Britain or whatever, you don't know what their political uh, sort of um, uh, where they are exactly, on the, are, yes. you know, leaning on right or something. But I think, um, yeah, a lot of people just kind of don't really even quite understand the why. And, and it's just sort of almost like an eccentric part. It almost feels to them like, this is the way I interpret that this is just British, ex not exceptionalism, but British eccentricism, <laughs> if that's a word. Uh, but um, just, you know, that they think, oh, well, the typical Britain or something, you know, uh, why? Because they think, well, everything's different. You know, the the plugs. Driving on the other side of the road. and Sockets are different. or <laughs> The um, sockets are different. Yeah, so... driving on the other side of the road or whatever, you know, there's, there's all the uh, different measurements and, and whatever. And uh, But, um, yeah, I, I think some people just, uh, you just get, get a kind of, like, it doesn't really make much sense or something. But then a lot of people as well are not really into politics, which is... And so I don't know how much people have kind of how much the common person really stops to th even think about it, actually. Do you know what I mean? If, if you were in, if you were British and let's say another country that was in the EU left, let's say. Um, the Netherlands. <laughs> well, I was, I was, but yeah, OK, let's say the Netherlands. And then I don't know. um how many people in Britain would actually be kind of Commenting going around sort of yeah. asking, well, why, why did you leave? And I think people just kind of, uh, you know, it's not your country. You don't really, you don't really care anyway. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, I haven't, I haven't had deep discussions about, uh, about um, people like asking me like, why did, why did your country leave? Um, or uh, certainly not maybe at, at first, but not for a long time. But as we've seen with, and you know, you've been following British media from from Poland, like as we've seen over over the last number of years, how uh, the likes of the BBC have avoided talking about Brexit. Now that the election is is on the horizon, do, and it's likely that Labour will get into power, what would you like to see from the Labour Party when it comes to 
uh, its approach to Europe. Uh, sorry, a Labour government. What, what would you like to see with a, a Labour government when it's, uh, when it's dealing with the European Union? I mean, Labour recently have been going on about, you know, their sort of election campaign is underway now and uh, they, they've been going on about um, honesty, about honesty about the economy and so on. Well, if you're going to be honest about the economy, then, well, the economy, Brexit, is yes. a huge amount of Brexit is the economy. So if you're going to be honest about economy, you've got to be honest about about Brexit. But it seems like their sort of honesty about the economy is just being honest that well, we're not going to spend money on every throw money at everything. But if you want extra money, well, you know, maybe trading EU and all that stuff, yeah, might actually help. But I think I think you're. Uh, I, th I think um, you've mentioned about uh, and other um, speculators on politics have mentioned that probably Labour will play it safe in the first, let's say, the first term. And then the sort of discussion will kind of maybe go start, discussions might start taking place about, well, because, I mean, the way that they go, they're going to just ignore this you know the bre the problems of brexit which they have been doing so far then well they're going to really hit the reality is going to hit because they're going to need um you know i mean these brexit border check things are going to be coming well are coming in and it's just absolutely you know ridiculous amount of wasted money and uh or lack of money coming in of, um and I, I just think the reality will um will kind of hate there, there was a, yeah, there, there my, was a... my expectations are very low um I'm, i am pro sort of labor you know i i don't want the tories to to, to win but um you know they're the ones who brought brexit and but i think um my expectations are pretty low for for what they're going to do definitely in the first term i think um and he, he, it's annoying because even the lib dems um don't seem to have a pro eu or a leader who's willing to talk about the eu and so there's just a lot of people who don't you know a lot of people in britain who are voting don't don't actually have someone a major party speaking for them at the moment so uh, yeah think... it seems to me yeah when it comes to rejoining the european union or better relationship a better relationship with the european union the main parties that are pushing this are maybe the um the green party and uh the snp in scotland but uh, yeah you'll be hoping that labor so, uh, although you know to not to to throw attempt to throw labor under a bus here but they have been saying that they want to have a better relationship with the european union. they want to have a sps agreement when it comes to um a veterinary agreement so they want to improve things. They want to maybe have dynamic alignment. Um, so when the EU moves in a particular direction, the EU standards, Britain aligns automatically with that. Um, so that that would help. But being outside the single market and being outside the EU is still going to be a massive problem. I don't um, see why. I don't see why they can't just um, at least have the debate about it. Yeah, and that would sort of give. You know, I know people say, well, you know, we get Brexit done in the other previous election. We don't want to talk about this thing anymore. People are fed up with talking about Brexit. But I think I think it's um, we all know that, you know, Brexit wasn't very um, it, it didn't seem very fair because the we ended up with this very sort of hard Brexit. Well, whether you want to say it wasn't implemented properly whatever but uh like farage would say but it was a, it was a very hard brexit and there was no need for it to be that way and basically a fairer way would have actually been to have a kind of a soft brexit because then you would have had brexit for the full 52 percent and you would have had you know a soft brexit for the 48 percent, or or the 48 percent and the other people who just didn't vote or weren't old enough to vote, who now are old enough to vote, and so on, right? Or people who were living in other countries, enjoying the benefits of the uh, EU and so on. But um, I think uh, I think it would be nice just actually if they could start actually having 
debate about these and being honest about the problem. And I think once they're in power, power, and depending on who's the opposition, we'll have a, you know, I mean, you'd assume it's the Conservatives, but if it isn't, then suddenly you, you know, then you can actually really actually have a open up sort of uh, have an honest debate because the problem is the last five plus years there hasn't been an honest debate on the media about brexit i mean there's, there's people like yourself probably shouting at the television screen every single time there's some kind of interview by Kay burley or coonsberg or whoever and they're not um they're not mentioning, they're not picking up politicians on, you know, Kemi Badenoch comes on or something and just makes up some numbers or something and, and no one's calling out. Yeah, but, but as you said, is there, is, yeah, there was a, there was a perfect example of this last week where um, they were talking about rainbow lanyards at on the same, in the same period as when there were, uh, there were new, the, 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 the government had talked about the extra cost for, businesses sending goods from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. So it's um for a, a trusted trader scheme, yeah. excuse me, which is going to cost which is costing half a billion pounds. So there was no talk about that. And I think Phil from a different boy bias yeah. mentioned it that it was in the new it was in the newspaper, in the BBC sorry, on the BBC website, but you had to actually search for this information. Um but the rainbow colored lanyards and stuff like this, this was front and center for a few days. So the media, I, I I keep criticizing the media because they they've dropped the ball and they don't, they're not informing people. There there isn't honesty, not not just in politics but also in the media where they need to explain to people this is <clears throat> these are the consequences of Brexit yeah. and it's not just we got Brexit done, it's done and over, you know, it's over and done with. Now we move on to other things. As you said before, there are checks coming out, uh, checks coming in, I should say, um, later on in the year, uh, when. The conservatives are no longer in power, and this is something Labour are going to have to deal with. So they're going to have to be honest and say, I, I said before, um, how what they need to do is say, look, we would like to achieve X, Y, and Z, but because of Brexit, we can't. We'd like to bring down the NHS waiting list, but we can't uh, bring it down because we need the doctors and nurses. So we need to free up you know, the immigration limits. We need to bring people in. I think they need to be honest with people about these things. Yeah, I mean they can all they can always say, look, we're not the party that brought you Brexit. I mean, obviously yeah. they didn't completely oppose it, uh, but they can still say that you know this this was a, a conservative problem that they're sort of fixing um, or having to deal with. Uh, I don't know how easy that that is politically to how easy that boat is to steer, but. Um, uh, Again, if you're talking about just having an honest conversation, if if the if there is a kind of a Tory wipeout at the next election, then you can actually maybe have fewer stories going around about rainbow-coloured lanyards and sex scandals, and let's hope that there's a a, a bit less of these things and uh, you know I, I think I think it wouldn't be bad just maybe it's bad for your channel but it wouldn't <laughs> be bad just to have a bit more boring sort of politics for a bit because when problems get so big as they are then um, you know it, it's better to just sort of have actual proper debates and actual action going on to deal with them rather than just some kind of electioneering politics and some create what's the next crazy story this week and uh, no no but I, I agree 100% so like, like um so what what's your take on for example the theater of pmqs and the what i believe is the real work that takes place in for example the select committees um yeah, I mean, I, I love PMQs actually. Yeah. <laughs> I, I watch it um, almost uh, like a sport that I would follow. <laughs> it's but, like um, a sport. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, last week was very different with the um, infected blood scandal, where there was just just plain questions and responses. There wasn't any jokes or anything. And in a way, I would actually rather see 
a bit more of that sometimes. I mean, nobody would watch it actually if if that happened. Um, so I don't know, but that's what I'm talking about. I think I think on in some uh, televised, um, I think politics has just become a bit more of a, an entertainment thing now, and that's great. But at the same time. It's really frustrating when there are actual sort of real problems uh, that you just want people to like. Actually, you you see on YouTube comments when there's a, an interview or PMQs, and the most repeated comment is just answer the question. Yes, <laughs> and it's getting really annoying now with these um, sort of just basically responses to questions not actual i mean i i really want to see the back of sunak to be honest because this sort of you know it's becoming a meme now you know the press the corbyn button or uh or i mean it used to be union paymasters or something like you you, <laughs> you people just quote what the next it's like a bingo card or something that I don't know. I, I think um... I, I think it, it's sort of it's it's always been around, but I think it was really amplified during the time of Boris Johnson. Yeah. So Boris Johnson really made it into a sort of spectator or into a sport. Or a, a, he, I think he believed it like a debating chamber. So it's like, yeah, we just have a debate on these. It's not actually PMQ. It's not asking me questions and I answer the question because it, he would either lie or he would just not answer the question. Um, and 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 like I was very frustrated with it as well because somebody would raise a very interesting point or very important que ask a very important question, and the response was some sort of waffle or just a lie or you know what about you or something like that. And you know you would imagine like in a normal situation if you were to ask somebody a question they'd be like well that's an interesting question or let me have a think about it or here is the answer. That's what we that's what we should be expecting. You could have a bit of theater in it, but at the end of the day, what's the point in asking a question if the person is not going to answer it? And there's mm. no obligation on them from the speaker or whatever to answer that question. It just becomes a charade, just a waste of time. Mm. Yeah, I, th I think I think Sunak's actually copied a lot of things from Johnson, but he, he isn't Boris He's Johnson not. and <laughs> You know, so you you've got kind of the worst of both worlds going on there. Because, you know, uh, you know. But anyway, so um, it's frustrating, uh, actually. Um, we're almost at the end of this, so I just wanted to ask you about the the election. What what are you expecting to see in the election? What would you hope to see in the election? Um, assuming you mean the UK general election. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been following. I think the Polish one has been uh, is is just over. So well, I don't know. You could be talk, asking about Trump or something. But <laughs> um, I think um, I think I, I think the polls have been steady for such a long time that it's highly unlikely that some kind of shock now is going to happen. Um, you know, I'm not. I'm not a massive poll fan. We know what happened with Brexit. Um, so touch wood, so, you know, it doesn't <laughs> happen again. But uh, I think, um, I don't think even Sunak really thinks he he will win. Um, I think probably, you know, I think probably people will a lot of people will still vote for the Conservative Party. Um, and, you know, don't ask me why, but uh, I think it's not going to be quite as spectacular as some people are predicting. Like 1987. Yeah, I mean, I, I, rem I remember that. Actually, I'm old enough to remember that. But um, the, I think basically Labour will just have a... A good majority um and i don't know probably the tories you'd expect them to be the opposition but uh because i'm a little bit skeptical about this kind of some of the polls that have come out 
Um, I'm really unsure about the Lib Dems because I think tactical voting is a thing now, right? I think this is, I think there's going to be various amounts of tactical voting, which I don't know if that will balance it out, if that means Lib Dems and Labour will kind of split the tactical votes. I don't really know how that works because I haven't looked at the, the numbers on that. So that's an interesting thing to actually, somebody to analyse, crunch the numbers. Um, I don't, will, will reform get any votes, any seats? Sorry, uh, probably yeah, not. I'm not sure about that. Um, um, I think Labour can do, probably could do better in Scotland. Um, and I don't know, I think it would just be, I'm not, I'm not predicting any big crazy stuff. Um, but the thing is, here's my prediction that from what I've seen, because I have been following UK politics really closely for years now, Rishi Sunak is a terrible um, campaigner from what I've seen, from what little ever, he seems to want to avoid, uh, you know, keep him out, like Theresa May, keep keep her out of the way, like don't, don't <laughs> you know, whatever. And, you know, Theresa May, I think she had a big majority like in the polls, and then it sort of dropped, like you know, like halved or something. By the time the, uh, Corbyn actually had a quite a good uh, election that time uh, before the Boris Johnson one, and I think Sunak is probably going to make a big. Well, he's already made a big error on the first day because he had not one but two uh, Tory councillors. They found now in this um, biscuit factory in high vis jackets. Yes. <laughs> Because you did a video where there was, you said there was one. There were, apparently, there were two. There were two right? so, yes. <laughs> I, I think I think the guys. Have, he, like, he was also he was also in Wales, um, meeting uh, people in Wales, and he said, uh, "Are you are you looking forward to the Euro twenty the Euro uh, the Euro final? Oh, sorry, the Euros." Football. And they're like, well, "We haven't qualified. Wales didn't qualify." <laughs> like, ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, well, he probably just assumed they were supporting England, uh, <laughs> or something. You know, so. Um, yeah, the, 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 I, I watched those hustings uh, when it was Truss versus Sunak, which were just bizarre. And, you know, they it's sort of any connection to a place, you know, the, he would say something like, oh, I, I came here once or something, you know, and it's, uh, nobody's buying, buying this sort of stuff, you know. Or, or Truss would say something like, well, I, I, I'm from this part originally or something and <laughs> I, I I just I don't I think Sunak will make just a lot of errors and I think if anything I think if 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 there is if those polls do ref, you know don't Stay change don't are. don't shorten then that's because Sunak's gonna or they get even worse I think that's because Sunak's gonna say something really stupid uh, maybe not a John Prescott, was it? The, no, no, no. Who was it? Who? No, Gordon Brown, who, who you know, the bigots woman thing. But yeah. I don't think, <laughs> I don't think it would be something like that. It would just be, you know, he's already. No, he, yeah, he, he's he's very prepared. So, but it will be somebody else putting him in a position where he he's not able to respond or um, where he's. Well, we had a... we had the lady he was laughing at or something or walking away from in. I, well, I don't know Winchester or something. It was, uh, and and uh, then he went back to apologise or something. And you know he hasn't had much experience of really because all these times when he's in a biscuit factory or something, they're very controlled, even more controlled than they're meant. meant you know, as we found out, than, than they're meant to look. But uh, uh, when he's sort of literally just let loose uh, in into the uh, the wild or something, uh, he seems to be. Uh, not not good. So I I I think if if there is this huge wipeout, I think it's I, I think it would be it's possible. I think it's possible, but it would be because his campaign would just be a complete disaster or something. Um, so yeah, I I I I still hold that as a possibility based on that uh, factor. Fantastic. So thanks so much for speaking with me today about Brexit and about your experiences with Brexit and uh, and, and the situation in Poland. Um, it'd be great to speak with you again, maybe in the future about this and see how things have improved, maybe also after the, the general election, see if Labour have changed their position, if they're more open uh, to the European Union. And be interesting to see, uh, to hear from maybe some Polish people 
um, maybe who have been to the UK and have returned, if you if you get your uh, your take on that as well. So thanks so much, uh, Ed for Edgar for speaking with me today. Absolute pleasure. Thank you thanks very much. Okay. Bye.